Um, hello, everybody, and thank you so much for joining us today and being here. Um, this is like, first of all, happy Black History Month. Um, this is such an unconventional way of meeting one another, but um, thank you all for being here and um, giving us your time today. And I know everyone on the panel is really excited um, for what we have in store for today. Um, I want to, I will speak more about um, what we're gonna be doing today, but first I wanna make sure that we are welcomed into the space in a good way. Um, today we have um, Temo Singh, Temo AKA Chaz Elliott, who is a Coast Salish artist from the Saanich First Nations and the Songhees First Nation, which, is both, which both territories are located on the Southern end of Vancouver Island. Temo Singh was born and raised in Start, Start Slip Reserve. Temo Singh attributes his passion and knowledge of the Salish art to his father, Charles Elliott Sr., who was a master carver. Temo Singh's work can be found in different parts of the world, which include paintings and carvings that entail the history, legends, and knowledge of his ancestors. Um, can everyone please give a nice welcome to Temo Singh? Okay. Thank you, Charity. So in my uh, native language, I'll give a land acknowledgement first. I squachohela osiam thanashelacha nashikwanshia Elanox, the Kwasangi, Zita Lakong, Ita Hosainich Nashelicha, Nashiat the Kaka Tano, the Mokwa, Ita Jas and Nashelicha, ETS Kapes. Good day, everyone. My respected friends and my respected relatives, I'd like to acknowledge the homelands of the Songhees, Esquimalt, and Sandwich Nations, and I'd also like to acknowledge the sacred lands and the sacred waters that we all live on that give us life to wherever we live, wherever that may be. I'd also like to acknowledge everyone in attendance today. The speakers and those holding the gathering today, I want to say thank you. Respected friends and relatives, it's an honor to be here today. And I understand that many in attendance are tuning in from different parts of BC and across Canada. I'm humbled and I would like to say with great respect, thank you for allowing me to share during your time and space, Aishka Hale. The ball rolling here, I'm gonna. Okay, thank you so much for that. I really appreciate it. Um, yeah, I, I feel like it's always right to start with um, a welcoming in a good way and a light acknowledgement. Um, they're so important, especially to remember that um, you know, if you're not from these nations and we are all visitors um, on this land and it's always important to acknowledge and understand why that's important. But yeah, okay, so um, this event is brought to you guys all by the BC Black History and Awareness Society. Um, I am the Youth Engagement Coordinator for the Society and I'm so excited to be doing this um, as a part of Black History Month 2021. Black History Month is a time when we celebrate achievements by Black people. It was started in 1926 in the U.S. and officially observed across Canada for the first time um, 25 years ago in February 1996. Black History Month is not only about the past, but it's also a time when we reflect on how we will shape the present and future history to create more justice in our daily lives and institutions. The BC Black History Awareness Society was started long before the official um, comm commemoration of Black History Month in Canada. We have been bringing events to educate about, about, honor, and celebrate the contributions, achievements, and struggles of Black Canadians, not only during Black History Month, but throughout the year. Our society has many projects in addition to our events and exhibits that educate about Black history. We are working to increase the presence of Black history in our schools and to make sure our museums include exhibits that showcase the lives and impacts of people of African heritage in BC. Many of the stories of our people and accomplishments have been erased from the teaching of history by our schools and institutions, but we won't tolerate being made invisible. Our lives, our struggles and accomplishments are an integral part of the fabric of the province and the country. And I'll fight to ensure that everyone has the opportunity to learn our history. Now, I would really love um, to introduce our guest panelists for today. 
Uh, the first is the complete legend, Ernie Pac um, Panicoli. Uh, Ernie is a Native American who grew up in a, in a white man's society. Ernie broke the barrier of stereotypes as a young man growing up in Brooklyn in the 1970s. Panicoli picked up a camera for the first time and instantly converted his interests and abilities from painter to photographer. Ernest by Panicoli started his journey of wholeheartedly capturing the scene during the most fertile years of hip hop. Always armed with a 35 millimeter camera, he successfully photographed nearly every rapper of note since the genre's inception, making him the go-to photographer for magazines like Word Up and Rap Masters. Hip hop at the end of the world um, is a carefully curated selection of photographs from Brother Ernie's extensive archives celebrating over 40 years of swag and one of the most complete records of the most crucial movements in American music. He also was inducted into the Hip Hop Hall of Fame in 2014, which is so cool. Um, and I also want to introduce our second panelist, Shane Buck. Shane grew up in Canada and Ghana. His first collection, Ceiling of Sticks, won the Prairie Shoners Book Prize and the Great Lakes Colleagues Association New Writers Award. His second volume, Contronic won the Archibald Lampman Award and was finalist for the Canadian Authors Association Award, Ottawa Book Award, and Griffin Poetry Prize. He did his graduate work at New York University and the Iowa Writers Workshop and Stanford University, where he was a Stinger, Stinger Fellow. Among his many honors are New York Times Fellowship, an Academy of American Poet Prize, and a National Magazine Award. He is also a filmmaker whose award-winning work has screened at festivals around the world and on television. He is an associate professor in the Department of Writing at the Uni University of Victoria, and his next volume of poetry, All Black Everything, will be published in June 2021. I am going to pass the mic <laughs> to Shane and Ernie, and they are going to be um, doing a little interview style for you all. So, please give them your full and undivided attention. Thanks, Charity. Thank you for that introduction. Peace. Bro Brother Ernie, can I call you Brother Ernie? That's what they call me on a good day. <laughs> so uh, thank you for, for joining us. And uh, it's a great honor to be able to speak with you today. Uh, I've uh, long looked at your work um, and uh, admired it. Uh, in some ways, I feel like I grew up with it um, and, uh, and, and I have that feeling of, of knowing you without knowing you. So thank you for, uh, for, for joining us today. I, I, I have a whole bunch of questions, but I don't want to be like a boring interviewer. So. I don't want to start with the usual stuff, but I do want to start with one sort of contemporary thing, which is just uh, to give my condolences to on the passing of Prince Marky D, which was uh, very recent. And I know you were you, you knew him. You do do you want to talk a little bit about him and his well, significance? Not just him, but we also lost uh, Lord Yoda, who was literally the brains and the heart of the Universal Zulu Nation. I'm the Supreme Minister of Culture for the Universal Zulu Nation. But it was his efforts that got me into the Hip Hop Hall of Fame. It was, you know, Africa Bambada was the leader. You know, I don't care who they put in there, we still have the consciousness of him as the leader. And I would ask him permission to do something or give him a suggestion. And the next thing would be to call Yoda. And Yoda is the cat that would make it happen. Yoda is the guy that would call three other brothers and they would call two sisters. And, you know, next thing you know, you get a phone call, that thing is done. It's taken care of. You know, the food's been delivered or the venue's been rented. Uh, we lost him. We lost uh, you, Roy. For yes. those of you who are not familiar with reggae, reggae is basically at the root of hip hop and uh, you, Roy, did probably the most lascivious song in history about smoking his chalice in the palace. I want to make it with your majesty, you know, and he did it with so much fun and so much beauty that it wasn't offensive to us. 
but I'm sure to the uh, certain folks it would be. We lost Tim and <clears throat> uh, we lost Trotsky Love recently. Uh, it's just been one. And MF Doom talk. as well. MF, oh. Don't even talk about MF Doom because in my book, I have MF Doom as a, as a kid. He was 16, 17. And, you know, his brother died, the group disbanded, and he was deported and had to go back to England. And he created or recreated or reimagined hip hop so that linguistically, verbally, uh, musically, you know, he, he, I'm a lover of language. And what he did with language, <laughs> we lost him. And, you know, it's just been one karate chop to the neck after the other. And even here where I live, you know, every day I get, you know, some terrible news. And if there's a uplift in it, it's that we have to love one another deeply and we have to care about one another. We have to acknowledge that life is not only sacred, but it's very fleeting. And we have to give thanks. We have to give thanks for every second that we're here. And we have to appreciate it. And I think one of the things that we've done is we've forgotten the sanctity and the beauty and the magic of love. This month I turned 74. So uh, to me, you know, I think about those things, man. And Every minute of every day, I give thanks. And you have to have thanks almost like vitamins in your spirit. Yes. And, uh, oh, another I, I neglected to mention in your list uh, as well, Malik B., one of the original uh, members of the Legendary Roots crew, uh, also recently. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's striking because many of these, these, uh, these giants were not very old. I mean, they were no, in their 50s, if that. 40s, maybe. Uh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's, uh, anyway, all the more, uh, yeah, as you say, all the more important to, to, to have gratitude. Mm -hmm. um, so just switching into, like, maybe perhaps a little happier vibe for a second, uh, which is your books. I mean, this, this is, I mean, one, this is, to me, this is the Bible of, of hip hop photography. This is the Old Testament, and th this would be the New Testament, uh, you know, and the Quran. I mean, these are uh, these are remarkable accomplishments. Uh, I'm referring to, for those of you who are only listening on audio, a book called Who Shot You? Uh, Brother Ernie's first, first collection, which is, um, uh, it's hard to find actually now. Um, I it just- should, it should be reprinted. Brother, I just re, uh, I just emailed and left messages for the editor and the person in charge, and I told them they don't owe me any money. They gave me a, a healthy, a, a obscene amount of money for the first book, and that they should re-release it, and it wouldn't cost them anything. And they were so rude, they didn't even return my calls. And I'm saying, just put it out there, and yeah. they probably got 2,000 copies in a warehouse somewhere. Yeah. They just got to put it back on the block. Yeah. But the reason that they did not reprint it is because of my struggles with possibly the most evil man on earth, uh, Rupert Murdoch. Oh. Uh, in the book is an essay called The Coming Colonization of Hip Hop. Yeah. And he did not want that. He said a memo. He said, that's not going to be published. So I said, OK, cool. I said, I lived a long life without a book and I'll live a long life without a goodbye and I didn't return their calls. And then uh, finally the book came out and it had the essay, but uh, Rupert Murdoch got the last laugh because almost nobody read the essay. <laughs> Everybody loves the pictures, but nobody read the essay. And the essay was written in 2001 and it told about the coming colonization of hip hop. Yeah. Because hip hop as a, as a vital force, they realize that they can use it for advertising and selling all kinds of, you know, and, and even uh, altering the business of our lifestyle. So mm -hmm. maybe that's why they didn't return my call, which is okay. <laughs> well, uh, I, I, I think I remember reading it. It was, you call it the second colonization. Is that the, yeah. The, yeah, yeah. And I was going to ask you, um, 
but before we go, well, before we go dive into that too, too deeply, <laughs> um, we'll come back to it. But what can you talk about your your, your coming up in Brooklyn, your your early <laughs> years? Uh, speaking of of of, uh, I guess. Um, it seemed like a lot of conflict, a lot of struggle, a lot of tough times. It's like what, you, you seem to be a person who can, who's found a way always to get around, whether it's Rupert Murdoch or some Irish or Italian kids on your block who are trying to beat you up. Like you always well, seem to- Actually, the, the, Irish kids, the Irish kids were kind of funny, man. They didn't bother nobody. Yeah. And I'd get into fights, they'd be on my side, which was surprising. And the Italian kids, uh, you know, they banded together, and I think part of their problem was that the girls liked me. You know, that, that can always be. <laughs> and they called me some names, and at that age, I didn't know what they meant. And mm -hmm. uh, racism is a funny thing, and I ended up joining, joining a black gang, the bishops in Brooklyn, in order to survive. I don't advocate anyone joining the gang, especially now, with the drugs and the guns and, you know, that level. But at that time, it was my uh, life, you know, where they throw you a life preserver. And, uh, you know, it was what it was. But there's a difference between me growing up in the early 50s and now. Now, you know, nine-year-olds carry nine-millimeter Glocks. So, you know, back then you had fists and uh, garrison belts, which were thick leather belts, and you put studs in it. and you know, baseball bats and that type of thing. Now, you know, uh, kids are armed to the teeth, especially in America, because here, you know, it's almost a sign of manhood to have five guns. So I don't recommend that for anybody, but it saved my life and it was a different time. And as far as struggle, whatever doesn't kill you makes you stronger. And you learn through adversity. And because of that, uh, I studied martial arts and I studied different techniques and I also studied Zen, which tells you, shows you ways to avoid the negativity. Martial arts helps you deal with the negativity. So it's like, you know, if, if your Zen is not good enough, then, you know, use your hands. And, uh, yes. Now, what, what martial art did you... Muda Kwan, which is the indigenous and the roots of Korean karate. Yeah. And to give you all just a taste, normally in, in regular martial arts, someone comes out to you, block and strike. In Muda Kwan, the block is a strike. <laughs> so there's that efficiency. And if you hit people in a certain place, they can no longer lift their arms. And that's generally where you say, push and go on. So go, go back to your Zen. Yeah, that's the, uh, that's the indigenous form of martial arts. And uh, it's also um, a more gentle because it dissuades someone quickly. Right, <laughs> right. So, so you were in Brooklyn, you were um, as a kid, Yep. And I read somewhere that you you left home fairly early, fairly young. <laughs> Thirteen, I hit the streets, yeah, and uh, luckily the streets didn't hit me. Yeah, I left home. Uh, we didn't have a lot of money. We didn't have a lot of we didn't have a lot of anything. So I figured me leaving left more for the other two. And then I got my PhD in Greenwich Village uh, from uh, the streets. And how did you uh, how did you manage to stay in school? I know you went to Chelsea. Uh, I, I perked up when I saw that because I when I lived in New York uh, when I was a student, I had um, I had a job teaching part time at uh, nearby high school, sort of just a little north of there, the Bayard Rustin High School for the Humanities. Um, so, so what, what, uh, how did you manage though to, to stay in school and, and be without a home? Uh, a lot of people took me in and, uh, for some reason I 
my mother understood. She she told us that she understood like a mother bird, which birds which would survive and which would not, and she knew I would. And the only thing she asked is that I got an education, and um, I stayed in school, in the streets. And now uh, that was in the early '60s, and because if you know the the lay of the land there. Chelsea's on Spring Street, which is now part of, called Soho, then it was Little Italy or whatever. But just a few blocks north was Greenwich Village. And in the 60s, you know, you had Bob Dylan, Jimi Hendrix, Richie Havens here, tons of people that you would sit in the coffee shops with. And it was a different world. And, and it, it introduced me to art. And growing up, uh, one of the people that I met that was homeless also was Richie Havens, who became, you know, an international icon. And he taught me to paint and draw, and he taught me survival skills. We used to sleep on the subways, and the police would come. He'd get arrested for being homeless, and because I was under 18, they wouldn't bother me. They'd, they'd just kick me off the train, and I'd jump the turnstile and come back a half hour later. <laughs> you know, it was... Um, it, it was it was literally the most fertile ground in the world at that time. I guess it was like Paris during the run uh, during their you know heyday or the Italy during the Renaissance. Uh, Greenwich Village uh, introduced me to jazz. Uh, I, I said that the first time I stayed at a friend's house, who also was a professor. And he let me sleep in his house during the day when he was at the, the uh, school at NYU. He was an associate professor. And he told me I could play whatever music I wanted. So I didn't want to scratch or mess anything up. So I just played what was on there. And the first piece of music that I played was my favorite thing by John Coltrane, which I say taught me or reinforced the idea to me that there is a higher power and that there is a God. And to this day, if I put on John Coltrane, my favorite things, knowing nothing about music, where it takes me and, and the, the changes almost every time that I've ever played it, I've learned something new about breaks and forms and, you know, so uh, jazz opened up a world to me and then meeting some of these people and seeing their lifestyle people that had two dollars in their pocket were the cleanest people in the world you know they, they just had a a shine they might not be able to afford a, a coffee but they were clean and they carried themselves and all of that rubbed off from me that was wow who, who were the some of the jazz musicians that you 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 ran ran into and got to know well one of them was cecil taylor wow and Cecil let me sleep on his couch. And C Cecil lived in a little crappy place on the Lower East Side. And Richie Havens lived about a block from him. I actually introduced them to each other. They didn't like each other because their music and everything was different, but I introduced them. And I remember falling asleep on his couch. Like he just let me go in and fall asleep if he was there or not. And I'd fall asleep. And during the night, all these jazz legends when the bars closed and the clubs closed, because we were close to slugs where everybody played, Sun Ra and, you know, and they would all come up to his house. Wow. And if, if I had a camera back then, I'd probably be a gazillionaire now. <laughs> they all came. And, and the thing I couldn't understand about Cecil, uh, and back then he was struggling. Nobody knew who he was. I mean, he was poor. He couldn't afford food. And... The thing that I loved about Cecil Taylor was that I'd fall asleep on the couch. He'd be playing. I had a little upright piano. He'd be playing. I'd wake up at 3 o'clock in the morning. He'd be playing. Next morning, he'd get up, take a shower, and he'd be playing. And, and that tenacity. And then I went to see him at, at, uh, at, at Carnegie Hall in these different places in front of you know, 10,000 people, 1,000 people, whatever. But I would, I would sit there and watch. And, you know, I wish I had videos of some of that, man, because that uh, 
introduced me to another world. Did you ever meet uh, Charles Mingus? Did you ever have any? Yes. There, there's a very sad story about Charlie Mingus. There was a little coffee shop across from the five spot. And being homeless and hungry, I was sitting there. I'd gone in to get a cup of coffee because it was so cold. And I was sitting there. And he came in and he sat next to me. And he's watching me and I'm just sitting there with my hands on the cup and I won't, because I want to keep it clean. I won't repeat what he said, but he said, are you going to drink that coffee or are you going to make love to it? And you know, he's, I was a kid. He's intimidating, big guy. And he scared the life out of me. And I said, look, man, I'm in the street and this is the only hot thing I had. He says, Oh shit. And he called the waiter and they gave me a meal. And just before he left, he looked at me and he said, you didn't finish your coffee. <laughs> <laughs> Later, knowing how uh, incredible this cat was, you know, I knew who he was because I saw his picture in front. But later, you know, it didn't mean anything. Coltrane, Miles, none of that meant anything. When you're 13, 14, 15, that don't mean nothing. Later, yeah. finding out who it was, I was like, <laughs> <laughs> I thought he was going to slap me the way I was holding my coffee. <laughs> Charlie Mingus. So you, so you had, uh, you, I mean, you had these great sort of like human to human interactions with these giants, these stars. It seems like well, your life is. No, is, it was a different world back then. Yeah. Back then, Miles would walk down the street and people would say, oh shit, that's Miles. Yeah. Now, you know, they got the little rapper did, you know, a mixtape and he got six bodyguards. I'm like, <laughs> the, the mentality, there was no internet, there was no TV, nobody watched TV. Matter of fact, right. you could brag about that. I don't watch TV. You know, right. so there was not that cult of personality. You right. had to be like, I, I can't even imagine anybody that would uh, garner, maybe the Beatles, but I can't imagine anybody that would garner uh, that type of attention. Right. You know, it, it just, and especially in jazz, you know, right. Ornette Coleman can walk in the room and nobody knew who Ornette Coleman was. You might have 10 of his albums. You just didn't know who he was. Right. And right. hip hop just twisted that, you know, <laughs> they twisted it. And, and that's why I was perfect with, with hip hop because, you know, they'd say, oh, this is this one or that's Biggie or whatever. I was like, man, please. I, I knew the giants. I knew the grandfathers, and and the, I I knew the you know, I knew the source of the river. Right, right. <laughs> You're playing in the shallow end. <laughs> <laughs> well, well. Speaking of speaking of sources, I know I know that you you also were influenced uh, pre hip hop by rock and roll, and uh, Jackie was it Jackie Wilson? I think you were. I you saw did your homework, brother. Yeah, I've been, I've been, I've been, I've been creeping yeah. on you for a while. <laughs> in, in Brooklyn, in Brooklyn, there was two places downtown Brooklyn, mm. the Fox and the Paramount. Mm. And the Fox and the Paramount used to have Christmas shows and Easter shows. And every kid in Brooklyn would go to those shows. And whatever was hot on the radio would be there. Uh, Jackie Wilson, Fats Domino, Chuck Berry. Uh, I, I could go on and on and on and on. Uh, Please Whoever do. Was high. Huh? Please do. Go on. Yeah. And on. Uh, you know, all these people, uh, the Isley brothers, uh, yeah. uh, you know, all these people, they would go on and they would perform one or two songs because the sad part about doo-wop and early rock and roll was that they only were allowed one or two songs. Then mm -hmm. the record label would rip them off, kick them out, and, and for the next 50 years make money. Mm. So you saw people like the Cadillacs, the Whispers, you know, all these people. And and being a kid, it, it was a highlight of the year. And and tickets were really expensive. They're like $4. <laughs> you, know, so, you, know, you could always move $4 off somebody and get into the shows. And, uh, yeah, I, rock and roll was, you know. Rock and roll was a seminal part of our, you know, existence. What was it specifically about Jackie Wilson that struck you? Uh, his duality. 
he could do a hard rock and roll song and then do uh he, he actually did a uh a classical joint mm. you know uh, or a gospel song or something his versatility was insane and uh one of the uh, just as a side note a couple of years ago i got johnny ace's album he only did one album and as soon as it was released, he played Russian Roulette and blew his brains out. But if you listen to that album, I think it's called Pledging My Love, there, there are like 12 songs on there. And each of the 12 songs is prophetic of music that's going to come. Folk rock, folk, gospel, so on and so forth. And uh, that, you know, Johnny Ace, A-C-E, look it up. Okay, and, uh, look him up. It's, it's a beautiful album. And the song... Pledging my love, yeah, has organ music and it's it's you know, yeah, boy. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, this is this is something I want to share with you all. This is the native public enemy. Oh, wow. See the feathers? See? Yeah, yeah. Oh. And this is one of my pictures of Biggie on my shirt. Oh yeah, I was going to ask you about that picture. I yeah, I was in his jeep one night. Well, actually. It was cold as hell, and somebody's beeping at me, and I look, and all I see is a blackness in the car. I don't see no light. The next thing I know, he's yelling out the window, hey, MF, get in the car. You're going to freeze your, you know, so <laughs> get in the car. And, and Tupac had just been killed. So oh. I asked him, I said, Biggie, man, what's going on? And he said that's all BS, that he had no beef with, with Tupac. Right. And that if Tupac had lived, they would be doing music together. I'm just going to share my screen and, and so people can see. And now they got the gold biggie statues. Oh, yeah. So can you all yeah, see? Right. Man, you did your homework, brother. This is the this is the photo you're talking about, right? Yes. Yes, that's the one on my shirt. Just so the audience can see. It's beautiful. Look, I'll tell you a story that's not in the book. Uh, that Averex jacket, uh, Years, a couple of years later, a guy came to my studio and he mm. said, Brother Ernie, we want to use that picture of Biggie with the Averex jacket on the inside of an Averex jacket because we want to sell it or auction it for kids for money, you know, to get money for the kids. So I said, sure, man, that's not a problem. And it turned out that Mary J. Blige was at the auction and she won. And when she opened up the jacket and saw that picture, she started to cry. So that's that's the untold story of that picture. Well, that picture is is one of many where you really there's an emotion. You you've managed to bring out it seems it seems like we almost we get a, a glimpse into a personality and a mood that the the person you're you're taking the picture of has. Like, how do you? I know this is kind of a probably a question you get asked all the time, but I think it's I'm trying to ask it in a more creative way. It's just you're. <laughs> Your method, like, is there, I mean, Henry Chalf Chalfant says that you have this unique ability to, to bring out who the person is and because you get to know them first. I think he said something like, you, you really establish a relationship with the person you're going to take a photo of. Is that, what, can you talk more about your process? Well, to be defined by a giant like Henry Chalfant is an honor. And um, before I became interested in photography, I was a painter. So in order to be a painter, and I was a, a, a I, I didn't do abstract. I, I worked figuratively. And in order to be a painter, you have to be intimate with your subjects. You have to know who they are. Otherwise, all your paintings look alike. And uh, I think, or I know that that carried over into my photography. Uh, and it was always, it's still a surprise to me, the magic of photography. I can do this and suddenly I, I capture a moment or uh, a, a whole genre in, in a 60th of a second, whereas before I might work on a painting for six months. Mm. So that's where that intimacy came from. And, and so you started out uh, you started out doing collages, I think, right? Yes. Um, and and can you talk about going into the Navy? 
Like what? What was the? <laughs> well, going from Kalas to Navy. Well, because like, I think they're related, aren't they, in some way? They're, they're related. They're, yes, they're, damn, you did your homework, brother. <laughs> I was in the Navy for six years because Brooklyn was just too, I had no education. Mm. I had no skill set. And Brooklyn just was not, it, it was just not, I, I just did not want to be another cat, you know, working a nine to five. And uh, I, I went into the Navy and I studied electronics and I studied uh, a lot of things. They didn't know what to do with me in the Navy. <laughs> they kept giving me tests and they're like, damn. And and at one point they even uh, filed charges against me for, uh, I believe insurrection because uh, they, they'd see me on the back, on the fan tail of the ship with 20 guys and we're all meditating and they didn't know what that was. And they thought that I was somehow creating a cult rather than just a prayer session. And, uh, so they brought me up on captain's mast and they're asking and, you know, they, they were not the brightest lights and they interviewed some of the people and they said uh, that the meditation and the prayer helps them cope. Mm. And well, it's political. No, it's not political. It's you finding out who you are and who you are in relationship to the cosmos and it helps you be a more defined person. So that was interesting, but then they wanted to, Anyhow, <laughs> that's how I got into the Navy. And um, so, what, what years were that? 1965 to 1971. I was in for six full years. So, did and you go to 19... Vietnam? We won't talk about that. Okay. Uh, 1967 to 1971, I worked on a collage book. Mm. Other people getting high and drunk, and I was working on a collage book, mm. and it didn't require paint or brushes. It was just glue and paste. And I released that book, and I think uh, 2009 mm. on Lulu.com is called A Series of Dreams, and it's possibly my most beautiful book, and the most intimate and the most personal. So. Uh, that was my linkage to collage, which eventually led into photography. Did, did you get, do you think you got any benefits from being in the Navy? Did you take away any skills that you used yeah, later? Yeah, when, <laughs> when I was first there, uh, I read a review they did of me. And, uh, you know, they, they give you reviews. And... Uh, they said he's charismatic. And I didn't know what charismatic was. So I said, <laughs> man, I have to work on that. <laughs> I was not the most erudite, uh, you know, intellectual, but they said he was charismatic. And uh, I said, well, you know, I, I talked to some people, they didn't know either. But I said, well, I don't want to get a bad review, so I'll have to work on that. You know, it's like, uh, yeah, I learned a lot of skills. I learned survival skills. I learned uh, how to deal with fear. I learned how to deal with death. I learned how to deal with a lot of things. And uh, uh, I, I don't want to get into any specifics, but it, it had a profound influence on me and in a positive way. And yes, it did uh, bring up the fact that I was charismatic. And now I don't see that as a bad thing, but at the time I didn't know that. He's charismatic. Oh man, I don't want to be charismatic. So, um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I hope I answered the question. Oh yeah, no, that was great. I so so you're oh I so you you leave <laughs> you leave Brooklyn, you you're in the Navy, and then in 71 you come out and uh, it's a it's a pretty tumultuous time. This the late sixties. So in a way, you sort of like. Did you have any awareness of the tumult of sixty eight in the United States? Yeah, actually, actually, we were very well. It's like opening up a door, and there's so many things behind it. Uh, we actually laughed when we heard that Dr. King was killed. We laughed. 
Wow. We thought it was funny. But wow. not because he died, but because every week we're out in the middle of nowhere and we get all these things. This happened, that happened. I was like, yeah, okay. Dr. King died. Yeah, okay. We didn't believe it because there was no internet, no phone, no nothing. We'd get newspapers that were four weeks old. So, you know, yes, we were aware of what was happening. And without going into a lot of detail, uh, the red, black, and green medallions that Public Enemy and Hip Hop made popular, years before that, we were wearing that on the ship. So that when we got off the ship and went into the bars and there was a conflict with other brothers from other ships, we would show that and it'd be like we had our own uh, branch of Black Panther parties. So yes, we were very much aware of what was going on uh, back in the world as Curtis Mayfield uh, so righteously put it back in the world. And uh, we were very much aware of that. And uh, we were also the victims of that because most of the enlisted men were from the inner cities and most of the uh, the upper echelon were, were from redneck places. So yes, we were very crucially aware of it. And we were also aware of the disparity in punishment. We were aware of a lot of things, trust me. And did, For, you, did yeah. you know, like, did you have the, um, well, it seems like the, the, the military brass or the, commanding officers were they were they just unaware of that you had this like panther party symbols or that you were uh politicized or did, was that just they didn't even know without going into a lot of detail we almost had a mutiny on three ships wow the lawrence the Belknap, and the third and um we got the word that there was going to be a mutiny Wow. And we armed ourselves and we were ready. And there we were about one third of the crew. So, wow. yes, uh, we were very much aware of what was happening external to uh, the ship and in the military. And the military, uh, you know, the Civil Rights Act was only pushed in 64, 65. So by 67, you had people... Uh, you know, that, that had been in the military 15, 20 years. Mm -hmm. So that didn't affect them. They still had that mentality. And in America, as I'm sure you're aware, uh, with the recent ex-president and his antics, mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, racism has not hidden its head too well. And uh, that could be an entire, not only a chapter in the book, but an entire, you know, series of books. Uh, there's so much that hasn't been told. Mm -hmm. our, our history is still a mystery. Mm -hmm. And that's where that, that's the beauty of Public Enemy and KRS One and Common and Paris and Wise Intelligent and the X Clan and the poor righteous teachers, in that they try to assimilate knowledge of self, of history, uh, into uh, the mathematics. And then uh, ironically, and I'll tell you a joke. Uh, that I didn't know. Uh, I was in the Navy with John Trudell. Hmm. And, and John Trudell is probably one of the, the brightest lights in Native music and a huge influence on me and a good friend and somebody I miss. He just died a couple of years ago. And if you follow John Trudell, T-R-U-D-E-L-L, -L, you'll see, but we're in the Navy together. Wow. Which is crazy. <laughs> wow. Wow. You know, it, me and John Trudell, I mean, that was like. So many concentric circles just all oh, yeah. overlapping. Huh? Yeah. Yeah. So you get out in 70, 71, and did you have, did you still like reconnect with, say, Richie Havens? Yes. From before? And, yes. And he, so he was a painter when you met him, right? Yes. And not really a singer or doing no, both? No, he had never. And then at one point, and this is something people don't know about Richie, uh, I, I wish I could show you the painting above my desk that he did. He did it in jail because he kept getting arrested for a horrible crime that he kept committing, which was being homeless. <laughs> right, right. It was called vagrancy. And uh, Richie, uh, at one point, 
before he even got into folk music, he would take me to a place in Brooklyn and he had two other or three other, I can't remember, uh, members of a group and they were singing gospel and doo-wop. Mm. And his daughter told me there's actually uh, some songs of him doing doo-wop wow. and some gospel music. So I talked to his daughter about a month ago and uh, yeah, I told her, I said, I remember and his, his, his younger sister told me the names of the guy in the group. So yeah, they remembered. So right. yeah, me and Richie stayed friends forever, man. Right. And he was such a huge, huge, huge spirit. Uh, there's a movie he did called Catch My Soul, mm. which is deeply profound. And he did a movie, I did a movie. He did a book, I did a book. And you know, we, we would just share with one another. And the great thing about Richie, he'd come to my house and see a bunch of stuff. And he said, I dig it. I said, here, put it in his bag. I go to his place and see a book or an album. He said, Take it. You know, that's just how we were. Because we were in the street and we had nothing. Right. So now we got all this, you know, and it's like, yeah, yeah, sure, man, take it. <laughs> you know, it like, we had no sense of propriety in that. So, yeah. For those of you who don't know, Richie Havens uh, also was a huge influence on me and the times, the times itself. And, yeah, can you uh, talk a little bit more about his, his his role? His like he was such a figure in folk music too. Right? Yes, what, just for people well, who don't also, know him. He also did a song called "The Clan," about the Ku Klux Klan. He who wears the mask of the Klan is a devil, not a man. You need to listen to that. And uh, there's so many personal. His songs were all personal, and he would take a lot of Bob Dylan and Beatle things and add the <clears throat> to them. You know, they were cool, but he added soul to them. And, uh, you know, uh, Here Comes the Sun is a perfect example. It's a perfect song by George Harrison. Richie added his own, Here Comes the Sun, you know. And uh, I always used to joke with him and tell him, man, you better not let me near that microphone, Chris. <laughs> and he always gave me the microphone. I said, no, I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. And uh, he was a powerful uh, brother. And he has a book called They Can't Hide Us Anymore, mm. where he talks about autism and children who have retardation and what he did to break through. Mm. I guarantee you, you won't be able to read that without tears in your eyes, but also love and empathy. Uh, and his movie's called uh, uh, Catch My Soul. Okay. I'm making notes. I'm Please. taking notes here. Please. I'm going to check all these out. Uh, they're, they're, all the end, they're all vitamins for your soul. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Uh, so you, so you get out, um, and you're, you're a visual artist, you get out of the Navy in 71. And then I guess I would imagine that graffiti is starting. Graffiti is appearing in a little bit. No, or is it just before that? No, graffiti was there. Uh, Graffiti is how I got into hip hop. Was I don't care how they, they try to push it in mass media. There was no hip hop. There was no such thing. There were graffiti artists. There were b-boys. There were DJs and MCs. And they were like this. And then Africa Bambada and Cowboy and Starsky Lovebug started saying, wait, there's a commonality. They're all black and Puerto Rican and you know, they're all in the streets. And they're all, you know, we could we could call this hip hop and, and put, you know, that, that umbrella over it and we could all work together and reflect one another. So the graffiti artists would be doing album covers for, for the MCs. The MCs would be working with the DJs. The DJ was more important than the MC back then because nobody could rap for four hours at a party. Nobody. Right, right. Even you, Roy, would be stumped. But <laughs> what happened was a DJ could DJ for four hours. Then you got somebody crazy like uh, Grandmaster Kaz who could rap, do graffiti, do b-boy, do MCing. I mean, you know, Grandmaster Kaz, uh, Hurt gets a lot of props and rightfully so, but Grandmaster Kaz does and, and did each. And he actually did the lyrics for the Sugar Hill Gang. Right. 
that was actually his that was stolen. He stolen. never got a job. But they they only got a nickel. So uh, you know, uh, history uh, is is funny. But yeah, Grandmaster Kaz, and there were other people like Kaz. Not a lot, but there were cats that could do all four. Right. You know, so, Carol, so Hunt, for example, could could DJ. He could uh, uh, paint. You know, he, he wrote. He was a graffiti artist. He was a hell. He, he is uh, MC, and he's also conscious. And he also, uh, I was there when they were creating the Temple of Hip Hop. Right. Just like a, a a more spiritual side of the Universal Zulu Nation, or a, a stream, a, a, a stripped down version of that. In that it was. Uh, predominantly uh, esoteric. Right. So so did you, uh, and I'm thinking of another character who, a person who seems to be always in every phase of hip hop, which is uh, Five Fab Freddy. Uh, <laughs> or Fab Five Freddy, rather. Uh, five, five. He seems to be everywhere. He's like in the first movie, he's in wild style, he's He's like, he, I read he was a graffiti artist. I mean, he's- yeah, But I'm gonna tell you something tell horrible. Tell me about, about it. it, tell us about I'm it. I'm gonna tell you something horrible about Fab Five Freddy. Yeah. He hasn't aged. He still looks like I he's know. 26. <laughs> <laughs> he's even in the first, uh, supposedly the first rap song on radio on Blondie's uh, Rapture. She mentions him. Yes. It's just wild. Video. Yeah. Uh, well, he also directed a lot of videos. He did. Uh, right. He di he directed uh, Karis One's Heal, Human Education Against Lies, and a lot of other things. So he's uh, basically for you know I don't want to overuse it, uh, but Fab Five Freddy is basically a Renaissance man. Mm. You know, in that he did all of that, and he also, uh, you know, had that authenticity. You know, he was there, and uh, yeah, he he's another one. Uh, I believe, and I don't know, I've never seen him, but uh, I wouldn't be surprised if he's a DJ also. Yeah. But or just those people, man, who uh, just keep, you know, being vibrant and keep being relevant. And uh, Fab Five Freddy's one of them, even though I'm mad at him because he never ages. <laughs> <laughs> so so when you're, you're hanging out in the 70s, and do you remember the first hip hop? event you went or where the music was first yeah, party? That, that's real easy. My son at that time uh, was, uh, he liked to roller skate. Everybody back then was roller skating. Like I said, you had no TV, you had nothing, you had nothing. So we would all go to this place in uh, New York called the Roxy. And the Roxy actually had all these people on stage, whether mm. it's uh, uh, Grandmaster Flash and the Furious Five or Melly Mel and Scorpio or even Hello Cool J or the cast of The Last Dragon and so And, you know, it was really expensive to get in. I think it was like $4. <laughs> you know? It was a different world. So you go in, there'd be like 2,000 people that are roller skating. And if, if you didn't meet half of hip hop there, then you must have been stoned or blind because they were all there. That, that was one of the seminal points. And the winters get bad throughout Europe and Canada, so I ain't got to tell you. But the winters in New York get bad. So you could be inside for five bucks, have a, a, a dope DJ, skate, and they had, you know, hot dogs or whatever. You know, come on, man. And it's safe. Right. You know, you might get robbed outside, but you won't get, get robbed inside because, you know, uh, certain people there would, you know, it would be expensive. <laughs> right, right. So yeah, that 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 that. Uh, the what years? Was one of my first. What years would that have been that you would have? Uh, well, my son was born in '69, so that would be '78, '79, '80, somewhere in there. And uh, okay. but um, that was the first. Uh, I wasn't good at hanging out because I was working two jobs. Right. What were you doing? Uh, I was working uh, as a systems analyst at Verizon, which was his art and his systems analyst. So, you know, and I worked in Harlem. So uh, I had to feed my kids, man. Mm. So between 71 and 78, are you 
Are you taking photos or are you? I, I think I started uh, photos in 70, 71, 72, somewhere around there. Okay. And what were you shooting? Graffiti. Okay. Because I would take people to go see something. I'd say, man, this is amazing. You have to go see this. And it'd be gone or tagged over or whitewashed or destroyed or some jackass would write, you know, Leo 28 all over it. Okay. And uh, so I said, damn. So I borrowed a camera and uh, I started taking pictures. Then all these little kids would come up to me. Well, first they all ran away because they said, here's a dude that's uh, Ralph McDaniels. Love you like cooked food. The uh, video music box, he was the first. The uh, kids would see me come up to the graffiti spots. And, you know, they didn't have permits. Hell's a permit. They'd just be painting. They'd see me coming. Here's this guy, six foot two, 250 pounds. He's a cop. So <laughs> everybody would take off. Finally, at one point, they said, a little kid, man, little kid. He's about five feet tall here. I ain't scared of you. <laughs> you sure? <laughs> yeah, you can't bust me. I said, uh, what are you talking about? Said, I'm just standing here. I said, yeah, I know. So what? So you a cop, right? I said, no. He said, what are you doing here? I said, I love the work. He said, you're kidding. That kid took me more places than I could. Back then, the Irish were in the subways. He had keys to everything. He took me to abandoned train stations and let me photograph and there were actually train stations where the the workers would hide their tools, you know, right. to clean up the maintenance. And and the graffiti artists had keys to that, and they would hide their, their spray paint in there. So was that like in the South Bronx, like the ghost yard? Oh, that was in or... all through Manhattan and Brooklyn. Okay, okay. Yeah. I tried to stay out the Bronx. Right. And did you meet Henry Shelfant in, in that, when you were in that? Time. If I tell you the story about Henry Shelfont, it, it might. Uh, I was up in the Bronx and I was with a gang up there and there was a problem and they had, someone had asked me to go up there and see if I could resolve it. So I'm with the leader of a gang and it's a hot day and I'm talking to him. He got three or four of his, you know, goons there and he's he's not really feeling what I'm saying. So I'm like, oh shit, let me get him out of here, man. So, you know, I was up there on a, mer a mission and he's respectful because he knew who sent me. So, and then I see this white guy walking up the street. He looked like a priest, white guy, you know, and I see all these, these, these Puerto Rican brothers, they're, they're running over there and they're about to grab him. And I told this cat, I said, man, that ain't cool. He ain't bothering nobody. He was in the alone. And he looked at me like I'm stupid. I said, man, this guy's really a knucklehead. I said, get your boys. He said, what are you talking about? I said, that cat, he ain't bothering nobody. He said, that's Henry. I said, I don't care who it is. Don't jump the guy. And then I look, and they're all hugging him. Wow. And I'm going to tell you something about Henry that people don't know. Henry not only photographed hip-hop, and, and graffiti, but Henry also, and I heard this from three or four people, and I don't want to put his business in the street, but Henry also paid bail for these kids mm. out of his pocket. Mm. And, he, and he went on to make uh, the, the big, the sort of the first big- Style right? Wars. Yeah. Style Wars. Yeah. Uh, Henry, Henry is a, not only a legend, but he's, he's an icon. Mm. And anybody that knows anything about hip hop, about graffiti, he's an icon. Mm. He's like a spiritual force. And he's this little skinny white guy, you know. And, you know, you got all these thugs and bugs and drugs all around him. He's just, he, he looks, he reminded me of a Zen master, you know, just somebody, yeah. you say something, he just smile. <laughs> So you're so you're up you're 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 shooting graffiti, but you're also sh working for 
the mayor, right? You're shooting, were you taking <laughs> pictures of the mayor? The man who did not like graffiti one bit, Ed oh, Cook. Cook. It's, it's a crazy story. I was taking pictures of some uh, celebrities, you know, and this woman comes up to me and she said, I, I like your style. I said, thank you. And, you know, she says, you don't grab pictures of people. You go up and talk to them and ask them for permission, whether it's Prince or whoever. And I said, yeah, because they're people. You don't just go up and, you know, I said, if somebody my size came up to me with a camera, it was a, I'd be intimidated. <laughs> she said, I like that. I said, well, it's called respect. She says, here's my card. Give me a call. So I put it in my pocket. I didn't think of it. And she ran into me later. And she said, would you like to work for us? I said, who's us? She said, NBC, which is, you know, the top WNBC. And I said, sure. You know, I'd like to have the job. She said, well, you come shoot all our celebrities that are on TV. So I got a job at NBC. And uh, it was live at five. And everybody, every day they'd have three or four Schwarzenegger or uh, Stallone, whoever. They would come and I'd take their picture of presidents, kings, Queens, crazy people, you know, and that that was that was my that was my side hustle. And I worked for a magazine and I had a day job. Wow. And through that, she became a publicist for the mayor. And of course I, I started to work for the mayor because he had a TV show and it was called Koch on Call. And Koch was a rabid, R A B I D hater. Of graffiti it's you know they should be castrated i looked at him i said are you serious he says you never know <laughs> and you know i listened to him rant but he was the t stereotypical new yorker i mean this guy was a old jewish uh, civil rights lawyer but he was new york to the bone to the bone and he was a stereotypical jewish lawyer but I found him fascinating because when he wasn't ranting, he, you know, we were talking and he was fascinating because he was complex and people didn't know about that complexity. But he hated graffiti because he felt that it was, uh, it destroyed the, 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 the purity of the city or made it look rancid. And, you know, he, he had very, and at the same time, I'd be hanging out with the graffiti artists and going there when they would be. <laughs> And so I had that duality, you know, that's where the Zen came in. How do I balance it? Mm, you know. you're, a, you're a double agent. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, uh, I remember they, uh, somewhere, I have to find it, there was a picture uh, of a portrait I did of Koch that got into the newspapers. And when I went with the graffiti crew to one of the houses, they had the picture and they all, they all tagged it. And, you know, somewhere I got that picture, you know, with them saying nice things about the mayor, not right. so nice things, but I have that picture. So. And, and can you talk a little bit about some of the, uh, the graffiti artists you were close to? I know you were close to Vulcan. Vulcan, uh, Vulcan was probably, uh, to this day, one of the most creative cats ever. Vulcan right. was, you all need to look him up because he didn't even want to be called a graffiti artist. He called himself, uh, I forget what he called himself, but an aerosol artist. And mm. he three-dimensionalized it. He brought in surrealism and, and abstraction and cubism. He brought in a lot of things. But there was Lee. There was uh, just a litany of people. And Did you know Lady, Lady Pink? Yes, I met her. I didn't, you know, I didn't hang with her, but... I, yeah, okay. Uh, uh, yeah. running. And uh, I have probably 25,000 pictures of graffiti. And, and other than a book called, they call it graffiti, again, on lulu.com, most okay. of my, 99% well, of my uh, graffiti work has never been published. As a matter of fact, uh, they call it graffiti is not only a graffiti book, but this is a gift to all you want to be photographers. It shows you new ways to shoot. Ah. And I did it subtly. And there's a lot of things. Just look at these pictures and say, how the hell did he do that? You know, for example, 
instead of shooting a piece of graffiti, I would shoot the reflection in the truck window oh. or a, a, a rain, a pool of rain, or, you know, in a window across the street. So right. there's a lot of lessons in that. And most, I don't, I don't know how many people actually uh, looked at it and said, uh, uh, actually said, wow, that's, that's pretty dope and understood it as um, uh, photography lessons. Right. You call, you call, I love your term for graffiti. I think you called it hieroglyphic Ebonics. Yes. That is yes. a, that is like, I mean, you should have a book called hieroglyphic Ebonics. That I, might be call, I, might, I might name my next book hieroglyphic Ebonics. Yes, please do. Uh, <laughs> It's so um, good. Talk about that a bit. Well, think about it. 99% of the people that are not in hip hop can't read, uh, can't read it. You know, it's like you or I going to Egypt. We couldn't, we can't read uh, hieroglyphics. And the, the language of the street is abonics. So it just naturally flowed that it would be hieroglyphic abonics. And uh, I'm glad, man, you really did your homework. You know, I got a new book coming out. What, tell us what, about it, please. What is it? Uh, it's it's going to be my best book. Oh, wow. Wow. And I'm still looking what's for it, a title. What's it called? called? Starkest. Oh, wow. Because each of the images are going to be stark. Oh, the James Brown, right on. And book of photography or? Yes. Oh, wow. It's going to be stark. Is that big pun? Yes, big pun. You were very close to him, huh? Oh, damn, you did your homework, brother. Yeah. And, and it's so funny because the first time I met him did, did, wasn't a good thing. Oh, wow, that's LL. That's... Uh, I, someone had set up a meeting with me and him, and uh, I won't say who, but uh, somebody was sitting there with a 9 millimeter and had their hand on it because mm -hmm. they see this big guy. They don't know who he is. Mm -hmm. That's me. And I had another guy bigger. And they're very nervous. They say, who's this? And, you know, Pun didn't know me. So, you know, the first time we met was kind of an itchy moment. Mm. But, uh, Could you tell us who, a bit about him? Because I don't know if people really know that much about Pun, him. He died so young. Pun was Puerto Rican. And the reason yeah. I mentioned he's Puerto Rican is because he was a Boricua to the, to the, oh, wow. to the heart. And uh, I'm just giving you all a... a a little taste of my new strip Amazing. down. Oh, Bobby Brown and Scorpio. And Scor <laughs> wow. <laughs> uh, Pun was one of the best lyricists ever in hip hop. Period. And I'm going to go out on a limb and say few could even touch him. But not only was he lyrically like that, but his flow was insane. His flow was insane. And he had no fear. Mm. He had no fear. He just, you know, his flow was uh, incredible. So if anybody listening doesn't know who Big Pun is, go listen to his music. Mm -hmm. and the same way MF Doom is unique mm. in that MF Doom uh, reimagined language, Pun reimagined language through mm. a South Bronx Puerto Rican perspective. Mm. And, uh, I, I'm not going to be ashamed to tell you I cried when Pun died. I did the last photo shoot with him. I was with him and his family at a studio until like 4 o'clock in the morning, like mm. three or four days before. And uh, I think Pun died on February 17th. And um, I cried when he died. I cried when Biggie died. You know, mm -hmm. it's, these are not people I've read about in a magazine. They're people I know of. Call them died too young, man. You know, mm -hmm. Pum was like 25. Mm -hmm. uh, and Tupac were like 26. Uh, Leah's like 20. You know, it's just like, well, it's almost like uh, you make a pact with the devil. You know, you get two good mm -hmm. years, you know, in exchange for your life. Right. But look up Big Pun. And, and uh, just, just staying with hip hop there, just in that early period, it seems like you, you basically shot all of the stars 
before they were maybe <laughs> <laughs> they were superstars. So how did you like you're in this? I imagine you're in these parties and you see people, MCs battling and DJ Cool Herc is, is on the turntables or, you know, but how do you like uh, do you just have a sixth sense about who's going to be yes, massive? Yes. Or? I, I think it's I think it's about energy. Mm. I think it's about energy. Uh, I remember if you look at all my pictures of Big L and anybody that doesn't know Big L, look up the song of Bonix. Mm -hmm. If a Bonix doesn't shock you with its originality and its flow, then you're past. You, you need to see a doctor because something's numb in your body. But <laughs> he would always be like this. Everybody around him is giving a little, 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 smoking weed, jumping up and down, acting crazy, hitting on women, and here's Big L. Mm. And I just recognize that stillness. Mm. And that's how I got pictures of him. Uh, there are just certain people that have certain uh, vibes that, that are spiritual or just, you know, like they're very much in that moment. They're very much aware and they're very conscious that, hey, <laughs> you know, whoa, other people, you know, their energy is like, like dust in the wind. Mm. But uh, they, yeah, I, I believe I had that. And also, if you look at my, my work, there's an intimacy because uh, unlike many photographers, I had respect for these young people and I identified as a young artist trying to find my way and trying to find my voice. Mm. And also so much of hip hop reminds me of jazz. Mm. How so? Uh, it's outsider. Right. You know, you have a, a, a Queen Latifah and you have a Billy Holiday. Right. You have a Rakim and a Miles Davis. Right. You know, you have, uh, you know, uh, a Charlie Mingus and a Kara's one. So, you know, uh, it's outside of music. It's, it's, it's uh, to borrow a phrase from the Masons, uh, it's the stone that the builder refused. Mm. Mm. Stone that the builder refused. Mm. And, uh, it's not predictable. It's not acceptable. It's not cool at the moment because everybody got their own bag. And here you come suddenly with a sharp left turn mm. and you know, uh, you're know you singing about a uh, bit of fruit. Right. Or you must learn a black cop, a whoop whoop, it's the sound of the police. Or it takes a nation of millions to hold us back. And you're playing, you know, some la la la, I love you you know, on the, on the other sides. So, um, yeah, it's outside of music. It's not only outside of music, it's outside of the people mm -hmm. finding their voice in an art form that is by its nature exclusionary. Mm -hmm. you know? So uh, you've got people like Paris, Chuck D, uh, so many, many, many people uh, that are so profound. I think one of the most overlooked artists is wise intelligent. There's a video called Illuminati. Mm -hmm. There's a brother in England that uh, a brother up in Canada told me about. Uh, we were we were doing a a, a show. Uh, actually, it was in upstate New York at Cornell University. By the way, mm -hmm. you go on the website. There's 21,000 of my pictures that you can see for free, no subscription. Just go I tried on. to look at them all, but I, I, I ran out of time. I couldn't watch them <laughs> all either. But it's 21,000, and it's, it's free. It's a lot. <laughs> no subscription, nothing, 21,000. Yeah. Uh, one yeah. thing I'm guilty of is being prolific. Oh, my God. Mm -hmm. no, one, no artist. I never said I was the, you know, James Van Der Zee or the... And, <laughs> but I'm the most prolific cat that ever picked up a, a camera in hip-hop. Um, mm -hmm. There's 21,000 of my pictures, and uh, you could see the whole, the whole span of hip hop in, in, in Cornell. I was up in Cornell, and this brother came up to me, and he said, who's your favorite rapper? So I said, well, right at the moment, probably Yasin Bey. Right, most definitely. Chuck D, uh, 
Nassim Bey is a monster. Oh, good yeah. Jesus. Yeah. Black on both sides. That when you do a song about water, <laughs> when you do a song about Umi says, and you incorporate jazz and soul and hip hop all in one song. Anyway, he comes up to me, he said, who's your favorite rapper? It's probably Nassim Bay, Karis, one of the uh, What do you know about the UK? I said, what is there to know? He said, there's a rapper in the UK who's probably the best rapper you ever heard in your life. So I've heard this about anywhere I go, there's always the best rapper. So I was like, okay, cool, all right, whatever. He said, no, listen. And he clicks it in on his phone, and I, I stood there like a, a simpleton. <laughs> his name is Akala. Akala. A-K-A-L-A. Akala. A-K-A-L-A. Okay. And the name of the song is Fire in the Booth, B-O-O-T-H. Okay. okay. Now, you know, you got to have tremendous cojones to come up to me and tell me about the greatest rapper or the dopest. I was like, okay, that takes a lot of courage right. to come up to an OG and tell me that. And he played it, and, and the circle I was in was a color. Mm. All right, I took that note down. Um, so you, there's a theme... I noticed in talking to you where you're, you mentioned the outsider part of jazz and the outsider part of hip hop. And when I think of your, your coming up as a young person, it seems you also were an outsider in Brooklyn. Uh, I, I read, I read uh, you talking about how people would call you names that you didn't, you basically weren't fitting in anywhere. They call you <laughs> Spick. You didn't know what that was. No, no. Uh, they, they, and the, and the, the Italian kids are beating on you, uh, and the black kids defended you. Right? Yeah, uh, I was getting the the living crap beat out of me one day, which was normal, and uh, I looked up and all I saw was fists and feet, and I'm laying there. It was a hot day, and all of a sudden I see black hands punching these guys in the face. And there's like four or five guys beating me and two guys, Leroy and James. And they, they're just kicking butt. And they lift me up. And I didn't know them. And one has a rag and he's wiping the blood off me. And he said, why did they jump you? I said, they jump me all the time. He said, they're not going to jump you no more. Mm. And they said, would you like to join our gang? <laughs> I said, mm. shit, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And from that day, nobody ever laid a hand on me. Mm. And, uh, yeah, race is a funny thing. Man. As a matter of fact, I, I once made a threat to the United States government. Uh, in an interview I did, I told them, uh, I'm going to write a book on race. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I, that book hasn't been written yet. There are people like Richard Pryor and different people who have written about race, right. but I don't think the, the definitive, the definitive book has been written on race. And mm. when you write about the, uh, the schools in Canada, and you read about the treatment of native peoples, yes. both here and in Africa and in the Middle East and, you know, so on. If anybody ever really writes a book on race, I think it will change the, the structure of things as they are. Mm. And, uh, you know, I, I don't think I'll have enough time to do it, but uh, I threatened the government, I threatened Sam, I said, I'm going to write a book on race. After that, the FBI didn't follow me or record me anymore. They left me alone. <laughs> so, so I was just coming back to. Uh, I know we went back in time for a second because I was just curious about. You, you see, it seems though as though 
you you're kind of adopted by uh, African American communities, yes. even in the yes. military, because you were you've got the affiliation to Black yes. Power. Um, yes. Was that were people cool with, like in the Black Power movement with you? Yes, I was actually uh, given That's your charisma. Is that your your, char your charismatic? Well, uh, I, I think I think most Black folks uh, have some native blood in them. And I also think that most black folks identify with oppression. Yes. Not with being oppressors, but rather being oppressed and understand the history without anything being said. Right. And ironically, when I was down south, even the white people uh, would tend to back off because they would say, uh, they, they would say, well, you know, I'd like to mess with this cat, but you know, my great grandmother was Cherokee, you know. Right. There's more Cherokee grandmothers than <laughs> the tribe would have to be 400 million in order to have that many Cherokee grandmothers. But, uh, <laughs> you know, so that kind of, you know, but oppression's a funny motherfucker. Yeah. You know, it is what it is. And I think people identified. And also the fact that anybody that knows me knows I don't take no shit. I mean, I'll just put that out there. And you can't come and talk half out your mouth in front of me. Mm -hmm. I don't care if you're the president of the United States or a graffiti artist. You know, I put that in check. And uh, that endeared me to many of the people in the Nation of Islam, which gave me access to the clubs because the people in the Nation of Islam were doing security at the clubs and would let me in before they let the artists in. And they would follow me around in the club to make sure nobody tried to, you know, uh, rob me or, you know, get drunk. And, and so uh, there were certain organizations that, that had respect for me. Uh, and it was my instant relationship with the, with the uh, uh, public enemy because they understood that and they respected that. And that opened up a lot of doors for me. And mm -hmm. the more conscious people in hip hop respected that and they knew this brother don't play. Mm -hmm. And I didn't carry a gun, I didn't have no swag, I didn't know, like, ooh. No, it was just the opposite. Right. And all of that worked in my favor to gain access to artists and to uh, things that other people were not able to get access to. And I was able to translate that into my images because I made a promise early on that I was going to make us look good and strong and iconic. Because right. growing up, we always looked like, yes, boss, and yes, cream wasabi, and all that old dumb shit, you know. So I made a vow and I kept that vow for all the years, 45 years I've been with my camera, I've kept that vow. My work is iconic, mm. and my work makes you look like the spirit and 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 the God and the magic and the power and the energy and the history that resides in each of us. Yeah, there's a there's a simultaneous in your photos. There's a simultaneous uh, vulnerability of the subject and dignity. There's always yeah. dignity in a, I, every image that I've seen of yours. Yes. Uh, and how yeah. how did you? Sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Oh, I was going to ask you about the nation of Islam. I think this is neglected, and it's very important in hip hop's origins. Uh, and and how did you come into contact with uh, brothers from the nation, the Fruit of Islam, like those security uh, security people, and like what what? How did you get to know those? It's Elijah Muhammad, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, who is the progenitor of the nation of Islam, after Master Farad Muhammad. He brought it to the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. Elijah Muhammad talked about the original man and the two million or three million Indians, so-called Indians. And he taught his people to always respect people that came from where I came from, where that bloodline is and so on. So they automatically respected me. Mm. And the fact that I also did not drink did not smoke, did not act like certain people, and that I conducted myself and carried myself a certain way, attracted them to me. And I met uh, uh, various ministers from the Nation of Islam, and they invited me to their mosque to speak on what I know. Mm -hmm. They never told me what to say. And I even spoke with Khalid Abdul Muhammad, 
we did lecture series together. Wow. And Khalid Abdul Muhammad was anything but a joke or a punk. Right. So these, you know, uh, I would walk into the mosque and I was the only cat that wasn't searched. Right. And I would actually, they'd actually ask me to go up and speak. There's tapes of me on the uh, uh, YouTube, which mm -hmm. shows me at the mosque speaking. And uh, when there was beef between different sects or in, in hip hop, we would take it to the mosque. Wow. And and we would arbitrate that. Myself, uh, Africa Bambada, uh, Minister Khalid Abdul Muhammad, uh, you know, different ministers. Because there was a lot of conflict and people had guns and people getting hurt. And we didn't want, you know, if we had a chance to work with, with Biggie and, and that whole drama, but that happened on the West Coast, mm. we, we could have put that, you know, stuff on hold. Mm. So it, it was not just being around cool people with bow ties. It was also about, I would call and say, look, man, we got a problem. We need this group from the Bronx and this Brook, this group from Brooklyn to, to get up to the mosque. And if the mosque asked you to come, you didn't say no. Mm. Mm. You know, if they said, hey, bring that here, we'll resolve it. You didn't say no. And at that time, you didn't say no to the Zulu nation either. No. A lot of people don't know that the Zulu nation has another wing of its, you know, other than the hip hop, that's the more militant wing. Right. Right. The Shaka Zulus who didn't play. Right. And, you know, they were the, they were the cats that when nobody would listen, they would get your attention. <laughs> right. And they were all. Right. So I hope that answered the question. Oh, yeah. No, totally. And in preparation for speaking with you, I, I called some of my cousins who grew up in Long Island and uh, they all went to either Roosevelt High School or Malvern. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, and my one cousin was a basketball star at Malvern and he said they, would, they had a rivalry with Roosevelt. My other cousins went to Roosevelt and they were in class with Chuck D and um, yeah, yeah. all those guys. And so um, my cousin Eric was saying that he would get off the bus at the team and they would have to run a gauntlet of the opposing <laughs> the fans and and flavor flame would be and chuck d would be in, in that gauntlet so he said you know we knew each other and then he talked about how chuck d had a radio show a little later yes. when he was at adelphi wbau yes. um and how and uh, i guess eric's friend also had a back-to-back -back. they had these competing shows um so he was just talking and, and one thing that i was surprised by and i guess i shouldn't have been was uh, he said that Flavor Flav was the most intellectual person of the lot. He said Flavor Flav was a concert pianist. Uh, he was the life of the party, but he was also had a, a fine mind. I mean, it was, can you talk a little uh, bit about those guys? Let me tell you a story. Uh, I called Flavor one day and I said, I want to do a video on you. We're making a movie. And he said, sure, brother. I said, come on out. So I go out there and I spend the day with him. And I, I just videotape him everywhere. And he's the most, I, I think maybe Jesus was more popular, you know, anywhere he went, you know, it was, and we go home to his house and he was living with his mother. And back then I had this big VHS camera and you had the VHS. So we put it in there and I sit down on the couch and he's sitting on my left and his mother comes and sits on the right. His mother's a church lady. Wow. And the tape goes on. He says, yo, mother. And, you know, his, his mother's sitting there. And here I am getting berated by his mother. And he's being yelled at and saying, you're a grown man. Why you, why you record filth like that? And she's ripping me. Mm. And he's, you know, so we did what real men do. <laughs> we, I swear, I've never been here. I am with this rap star in his house, and, and we're watching the video. And his mother is cooking us for dinner, and I was like, "Oh my god!" That was like one of the most embarrassing moments of my life. But uh, I remember the first time I went out to Freeport. Uh, Free, he lived in Freeport. Freeport was yeah. yeah, yeah, and uh, they had a, a place above a dentist's office 
It was called Spectrum. And uh, I get up there. That's where they record. recorded, right? Yeah. Yeah, my, and, my cousin also recorded songs with Chuck D in yeah. that same place. Yeah, you talked about and, that. And Flavor's there and the S1Ws, and there's yeah. no Chuck D. I said, where's Chuck? Oh, he's busy in New York. I was so pissed, and I knew me and Chuck would not get along because that that's BS. You don't, you don't, you know. And, you know, later I get a phone call from him and he apologized. Mm. And I remember getting knee surgery and supposed to meet Chuck and, and film him rec in the recording studio. And I get there and he comes out to the car and he sees me on crutches and he carries all my stuff. And me and Chuck became best friends because he understood my politics. I understood. One night, three o'clock in the morning, man, my phone rings. I pick it up. Like, Hello? Hey, Ernie, what's up? I said, who's this? Said, Chuck D. I said, what do you want? Man, it's three o'clock in the morning. He says, I'm in France, man. I don't know what time it is. <laughs> I said, what do you want? You, you just call me up to wake me up? I got to be up in three hours. He says, you want to do an album cover? I said, yeah, what? Well, he said, I want you to do my album cover. Matter of fact, I want you to do three or four. I said, okay, can't you call me during daytime? He says, man, I don't know what date, you know. And we became best friends, man. And if I tell you the amount of things that he has done for me and with me, and uh, him and KRS-One, Professor X is not, rest in peace, uh, they're, uh, Yasin Bey, they're just certain brothers who are, who transcend the medium of hip hop, transcend and realize that they have a voice, realize they have a presence, realize they have a power, and realize that to some degree they can alter our consciousness. Mm. These are the brothers that I was closest with and sisters. Mm. Mm. Now, when you're when we're thinking about the era, the height of a public enemy, or even their their from their first album. Let's say I know that people call that the golden era of hip hop. Uh, what 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 do you think was special about that time? Like what? It was before, and I'm not going to apologize for this. It was before the government got on the record labels and told them to depoliticize that and mm -hmm. take away some of that blackness. So they put out groups like N.W.A. which glorified. Uh, guns and violence and bullshit. And they put out a movie like Colors, which glorified gangs. And um, the United States government uh, tried to subdue us with crack, with you know, uh, incarceration, with uh, putting these bullshit groups out there you know, to, to promote drugs and bullshit and violence. So, uh, you know, this was the pre-censorship or pre, uh, it, it was, I think, to some degree before the government really became aware that this was a threat to their, uh, you keep people dumb, fat, and happy, and they're going to be dumb, fat, and happy. Mm -hmm. uh, KRS-One singing, You Must Learn, or Black Cop, or uh, so much of his work, Human Education Against Lies, um, uh, you know, Chuck D takes a million, a nation of millions, all his back, fight the power. You know, mm -hmm. there was so much music in the message. Uh, there was so much. And uh, the X Clan, everything they did was blacker than black, but because uh, Sonny Carson was Professor X's father, and Sonny Carson was a political uh, black power leader in Brooklyn. Mm -hmm. So it, this was like his offshoot. So mm -hmm. this, is, this is why. Uh, the music was so powerful. It's pre-censorship, and it's not censorship. You can do an album about anything, but it was like uh, that album might not, ne not necessarily get to the streets, or might not necessarily be promoted by the record labels. Mm -hmm. So they were scared to death of black power, and they were scared to death of black consciousness. Mm -hmm. They were also scared to death. And are still scared to death that, uh, you know, there are those of us who put their business in the street and threaten to do a book on race or an mm -hmm. album on race or a song on race. Uh, you know, you remember the uh, most deaf talking about being on a plane and 
may I help you? You know, and <laughs> you know. Yeah. Um, and so you, I think we're we're almost out of time. But we're going to go to questions soon, but I just wanted to get a a couple more questions to you, which is just uh, one of them is. So you, it ends around ninety two, the golden era, right? Eighty seven to ninety two, roughly. Or, 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 what, what did you say is the reason for it? Um, I, I've read some things about being bootlegging, kind of really ruined. Uh, you know, what, what, what do you think is the change in the early 90s? I think that answer could take more time than I got. But basically, yes. it was the idea that uh, rap at one point and hip hop was still relatively new and still relatively dangerous. And then uh, you had, uh, you know, people like Pharrell come out, uh, Happy, or what's that other thing that Chuck D dissed? He says, if I say that I'm, uh, what was that song? If I say that uh, Be Happy is my, was the number one jam, if I say it, damn it. You know, uh, <laughs> there was a lot of, you know, and, yeah. and plus hip hop had become so saturated and, you know, there were people that were singing about bling mm -hmm. and, you know, my car. And, uh, does that even have leather seats? And, you know, people were getting all zoomed up on Maseratis and uh, mm -hmm. brand names and uh, Fendi and Gucci. And uh, that was another factor. And mm -hmm. you had so many lame, whack rappers who were doing actually commercials for the man with drugs mm -hmm. and, you know, bullshit. And everybody's tougher than the cat next to him. But they don't, you go to their houses and they got beautiful living rooms, but there's not a book in sight. Right. You know, I have 96 inch TVs, but there's not a book in sight. And uh, they've done a lot of things in their life, but they've never read a book. And they know a lot, but they don't know anything about history. Right. And they don't know anything about economics. And they don't know how economics directly is, is a weapon. Uh, how right. it's so right. uh, that all of those things led to the bootlegging was a serious one. But it's funny they never bootleg country and western music. <laughs> they never bootleg, you know, a lot of, you know, I love you. Can we sleep together? You know, they they didn't bootleg that. They just bootlegged the stuff that they deemed was dangerous. Mm. And you know, crack came and crack decimated us. Mm. Crack decimated us as a community, as a people. So all of these factors led to the dissolution, but it's still there. If you listen to Akala, if you listen to Mars Intelligent, that song, that video, which is a copy of a video that me and Ben Bada and the, the, the Rocksteady crew did 25 years previous mm. called What You Gonna Do, in which we incorporated all the different gangs and, and the different black power sects, and we made a video called What You Gonna Do, which had the Nation of Islam, the Temple of Hip Hop, the, uh, you know, uh, all the different, you know, and uh, Wise Intelligent did a video called Illuminati. And if you mm -hmm. look, there's all these different black groups. Mm -hmm. So uh, a lot of things, a lot. That, that, that question is so deep and mm -hmm. so profound that mm -hmm. it would take me another two days to answer it. But again, it's about manipulation, the right. dumbing down of our people, right. and the desire to have us as emasculated politically and economically as possible. Right. And so just to bring it full circle, you, we started at the very beginning, I think we, we were almost going into your, your role as a culture, Minister of Culture for the Nation and I also read this uh, for the Universal Zulu Nation. Zulu Nation, and I remember reading. Uh, you had a quote from Public Enemy from Chuck D. My beloveds, let's get down to business. Mental self def uh, self defensive fitness, and I is there. Can you talk about well what that means? Mental self defensive fitness, and in terms of your role as a minister of culture for the Universal Zulu Nation. Why don't you ask me a hard question? <laughs> 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 I saved the good ones for last when you're yeah. tired, <laughs> when we're all tired. <laughs> I'm sorry. Chuck, 
Chuck is very quotable, but when he said, my beloved, right there, you stop, my beloved, right. my beloved, stop. Remember old telegrams? Stop. That right. was a period. My beloved. He didn't say my beloved people, my beloved black people. Uh, he said my beloved. Those of us in the Zulu Nation and in the Nation of Islam and in these different organizations, we refer to one another as beloved. My beloved. And you could put anything there, my beloved people, my beloved black people, my beloved brothers and sisters. No, he said, my beloved, and he stopped. Let's get down to business. That means put the bullshit aside. Put the games and, and, and the silliness and the sexuality and the drugs and, you know, my beloved, let's get down to business. And then he rhymes the last part and challenges us, mental, self defensive fitness. That's like the most perfect thing I ever heard in hip hop ever next to a collar, but, and, and next to most deaf and next to KRS one. And Rakim, right? I'm not even going to talk about Rakim. <laughs> Rakim, well, Rakim, Rakim is not, and I, I shouldn't put his business out there. He's not from this planet. Oh, he's, yeah. from, he's from a holy place. Yeah. And I, I'm so blessed to know him and to have spent time with him. And uh, Rakim, oh man, Rakim. Uh, there's so many quotables from Rakim. Yeah. Yeah. And one of his, uh, he said, he, he was talking about his album coming. He says, No one's been so long awaited since Jesus. <laughs> It's been so long awaited since Jesus, you know, and that's been 2,000 years. So, yeah, Rakim. But, you know, these are people that understood, and Chuck understood, the power of language. The power of language. Muhammad used language in the Middle East without Twitter or any of that stuff, just in the desert to transcribe the, the voice of the Creator to his people. Jesus had the sermons on the mount. Buddha, it's language. And if you, if you want to get deep in the beginning of the Christian Bible, it said, in the beginning was the Word. Mm -hmm. And the Word was God. And the word was with God. I could never read past that. Right. And, and here you are now. You have a universal audience. I can record this, and, and tomorrow they're listening to it in, in Abu Dhabi. Right. Or Paris. Or Brazil. Right. So when you use those words, use them with love and care and hope that they are like seeds that, that are planted and grow this beautiful plant. In, in the Bible, it, it's almost like prediction of right. In the beginning was the Word. Right there you stop. And the Word was God. And the Word was with God. Now, that that if that's not a rhyme, I don't know what is. Mm -hmm. So when Chuck says, my beloved, <laughs> let's get down to business mental self-defense if it, it all came together right right so how do you think we did how, how, how do you you did your homework it? I don't know how, how we, are you feeling how are you feeling about it I, I know I know you did you did your homework I'm proud of you man because uh, <laughs> you know you you dealt with you dealt with essence. Well, thank I'm you. I'm honored to have been interviewed by you, and I'm grateful. I'm grateful That's, for this post. It's Shit, a highlight. I'm just, I'm just grateful to be alive, man. I turned <laughs> 74 this month. All right. H happy birthday. Happy thank birthday. You. It's such such an honor to talk to you, and uh, uh, I hope you feel like we covered a lot. I mean, I. There's so much more we could talk about. Your life is so rich and fascinating, and your work is 
you know, it's, uh, it's enduring, it's uh, majestic, and there's a lot of it. So um, I hope we, well, we, we got to it, some part, of it. Part of it, brother, is that, and, and this is something I'd like to leave with the audience, is that everything that comes to you, through you, at you, by you, for you, there has to be a lesson in there. You gotta learn something. Mm -hmm. You're in love, and your 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 lover is doing the mailman, or you know, mm -hmm. you got a beautiful job. You worked hard. You studied. You get the job. You get fired. You know, you have two kids. One grows up to be a drug addict. One grows up to be a, a minister. You know, there's lessons in everything, and what you have to do is you have to isolate your emotions and your intellect and, and receive it in the spirit and try to translate that into something that helps you survive and sustain yourself. Mm -hmm. So there has to be a lesson. Everything, and anything good or bad that happens to you, you don't learn something from is a wasted experience. Mm. I think those are excellent words for, for us to, to end on in terms of our talk, but because uh, I, I understand there's some questions. And so I'm going to turn it over to Charity. And thank you again, Brother Ernie. Thank you. And uh, I'm grateful, deeply grateful. And uh, let's let's stay friends afterwards. Yeah, yeah, Please, yeah. We, yeah. yeah. You're in BC? I'm in Vancouver. Okay, uh, because but, yeah. I got people up there and I've been up there and one of my best friends up there is Oz 12. You know him? Uh-huh. Okay, uh -huh. Oz 12 and uh -huh. Corey Bullpit. Yeah. We'll try and to Corey get you. Huh? We, 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 once the pandemic is over, we'll try to get you to come up here. We'll, get, we'll I'll bring oh, you I up here. It, man. Yeah, I mean, yeah. that's my favorite place in the whole world. Okay. But Corey Bullpit is such an artist. Oh, my oh, God. Yeah. And Oz 12 is the funniest man on earth. <laughs> and a hell of a rapper, too. Charity! I don't know Guys, if that was... hope, but I like charity. <laughs> that was that was amazing. Um, I feel so honored to have been a part of that conversation. And I know we've I've been seeing some messages come in and people feel the same way. So thank you so much for giving us your time. Shane, oh my goodness, you're amazing. He's amazing. Isn't he amazing? I, I told you. I hope I hope nobody fell asleep and fell off their chair and got injured. <laughs> Well, I, I, I was the first interview I've ever done with anybody, so I, uh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm relieved it's over, but I'm, ha I'm happy. Uh, it was really a joy. So thank you. You did, thank you did so good. That's your first interview, man. You're, you're amazing. Wow. Uh, yeah. So we have a few um, questions here. Um, one, one, one of the first is, what was your most meaningful and impactful moment with an artist that changed your life for the better? Damn. <laughs> well, I'll tell you one of the most meaningful and one of the most beautiful. Uh, just around Christmas a couple of years ago, I was sitting at my desk and I was feeling blue. It was cold out and I had a lot of stuff on my mind and I was shuffling paper and the phone rang and I picked it up and I said, yeah, what's up? Who's this? Most F. I said, what's up? He said, I'm uh, doing my last show at the Apollo. I said, you want to hire me to take pictures? He said, no. I said, what's up? He said, I just need your strength there. I just need you to come up and give me a hug and hold me. I think when I went up there, there was like 50 people around. He just got out of his vehicle, came over and hugged me. And uh, I think that was very profound. I think uh, there's so many moments with Karis one with Chuck D, with Professor X. Uh, me and Professor X did lectures together. And um, Africa Van Bader, there's so many times where I saw the magic in that brother. And there's so many, so many, but uh, the one of most death is most recent and I'll remember that forever. Uh, you know, a brother of that magnitude reaching and saying, uh, I just need your strength, man. That's, 
That's beautiful. And, uh, I didn't even, I, I don't know. And also, if you look in my book, uh, Hip Hop at the End of the World, uh, which is right here. In the back, I gotta show you this, is the most transformative, thank you, uh, pulling the trigger. And uh, I'm sure, Charity, you've read it because I told you about it. But if you read that, you'll see why I cried when I read it. And it was done by Jessica Caremore, who's one of the most uh, beautiful women on earth and one of the most gifted uh, spoken word and poets and poetic women. And she wrote that. And it literally put my entire life into a poem. And uh, I cried. I'm not going to, you know, front on you. I cried uh, because it tells me that someone, someone got it. <laughs> yeah. And there's only two kinds of people on this earth. And there's only two kinds of artists, those that get it and those that don't get it. Trust me. You know, uh, people say, well, why'd you like her? Or why'd you like him? Or why, you know, this or that. I said, well, uh, some people get it and some people don't. And all the people around me that you see me with, that you'll ever see me with, the people that get it, okay? And if anyone wanted to say something kind about me, just say, well, Brother Ernie, he may be old, or he may be a little, you know, this or that, but he gets it. So Charity and Shane, I think both of you get it. <laughs> Um, we have, I think we have somebody, well, first, before we get to this next question, um, somebody wrote in the chat, um, that this conversation is an honor to listen to. I'm humbled at the history and stories Ernie is sharing. Wow. His wow. theme of repeated connection with the artists is the most real and deeply supportive. It's beautiful to hear. Thought that wow. was just something nice that you'd want to, yeah. Thank you. Thank it's beautiful. You. Yeah. Thank you. Um, yeah, okay, so I think we have a question from somebody coming through right now. Sure. Oh, is that for me, Charity? This is Mike. Yeah, that's for you, buddy. Hey, hey, Ernie, we were just talking a bit ago. Mike Fiorito. Hello, hey, Mike. Just, how you doing, man? I've been enjoying this. You guys are a great conversation, and it's uh, uh, it's been a joy to listen to. I just have one you know, small question. I know we touched on it when we spoke. Uh, but what, which, which, which hip hop artists do you think incorporated jazz elements into their work? Uh, did the be did best incorporated jazz elements into their work? I mean, I have my own opinions, but what do you think? Well, I saw a movie called More Better Blues by Spike Lee, and his father's a jazz musician, and it was the worst movie, one of the worst movies I ever saw in my life. <laughs> I, mean, I like Spike Lee. But it was just terrible. Mm -hmm. And I saw a movie called Round Midnight with Dexter Gordon. And mm -hmm. I honestly believe that I've watched that movie 10 times. And every time I watch it, it touches my heart down, down to the core. Round Midnight is just like one of the most beautiful testaments. It's not even a movie, man. It's like an experience. And uh, that, that touched me. I think one of the artists who got it right was Guru when he did Jazz Mataz, one, two, and three. And also, I have to give big props to my brother Q-Tip because he incorporated jazz into hip hop and made it so that it's listenable and that it's uh, productive in uh, inciting or exciting people to listen to uh, yep. jazz in a whole new way and people come to my house and I put on the, the, the sources of those samples they're like oh he got that from Q-Tip I said no uh, <laughs> or from Tribe Called Quest no Tribe Called Quest got that from uh, you know Dexter Gordon or uh, you know whoever but uh, you know there, there's so much brilliance and ah. Uh, I think Guru did it absolutely the best. Mm. Thank you. And Guru used to call me Uncle Ernie. And uh, I have a picture of us hugging the last time I saw him. 
we did a lecture together in New York and there's a brother. Uh, I got to tell you a funny story about this brother. His name is Chuck and Chuck Reese. And uh, he came with me to Harlem to some black power thing. And uh, I asked him to get up and tell me, tell the audience about his take on public enemy. So Chuck, he gets up and he says, I didn't know what it was to be a black man until I heard public enemy and made me realize and make me understand what it means to be a black man. And my name is Chuck. So listening to Chuck on public enemy was enlightening for me. What I didn't tell Chuck when he was speaking is that in the third row, that cat with the little baseball cap was Chuck D. And Chuck came up and hugged him. And Chuck Reese, who's, you know, like me, he's just like, <laughs> and that was a beautiful moment. So, uh, yeah, Chuck was in the third row and he didn't realize uh, Chuck Reese that I was talking didn't realize that. So that's my Chuck D, one of my Chuck D stories. Um, I, our next question is from Caleb. Uh, hi, Brother Ernie. Hey, Shane. Hey, Charity. Uh, I had two quick questions to ask. As um, I know you worked with a couple magazines, Word Up, Vibe, but the main one I want to ask about was The Source, uh, working with David Mays and Benzino, I'm assuming, at the time for a while. Um, and I know you've been honored with this, the 360 Source Awards, but speaking of which, in your time there, did you happen to attend the 94 and 95 Source Awards, some of the most infamous nights of the actual magazine and the publication and stuff that some consider to be, you know, near the death of the golden era, uh, as Shane was talking about towards the end of the interview? And is there any highlights from them if you went? Thank you for the question. Uh, the sauce showed me very little love while I was out there. Very little love. Very little love. And uh, Mays, you're, everybody already knows the story about him. A funny yeah. story about Benzino. One day they hired me and they asked me to do a photo shoot with Benzino. So I get there and Benzino's not shaved and he got on a wrinkled shirt. So I said, you're going to get clean up so we could do this? He says, no. I said, what's up? He says, I'm not going to do no shoot. So I said, well, you know, I came all the way. He said, don't worry. He reaches in the pocket, gives me a handful of money, you know, stack of money. He says, just hang out with me for the day. <laughs> and that was the easiest photo shoot I ever had because I think I took three pictures of him. So the, sh the sauce showed me very little love. And I don't know why. Maybe because I was the chief photographer for Word Up Magazine for 25 years and that was their competition or whatever. So I don't really know. And then in 2018, 2019, they gave me, 2019, they gave me the Source 360 Award. And also, they put me on the cover as uh, one of hip hop's greatest photographers. So that was kind of mind blowing. Uh, there's a, a thing there behind me. I don't know if you can see. Uh, there's, you see that thing there? That's the cover of the Source. So, uh, wow. Hip hop's greatest photographer. So it was a strange love hate thing with them. And in answer to your specific question about the Source Award, yes, I was at both of them. And yes, uh, I remember, uh, what's his name from Death Row, saying uh, that uh, if, if you want to come to the West Coast and be on an album where the producer is not up, all up on your album, ooh, 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 he was making fun of Puffy and uh, Snoop. And uh, I, I remember that. And I remember sitting with Tupac, and I remember uh, one of them with uh, Biggie won the lyricist of the year, and he whispers in my ear, he said, this is shit, man, this can't be happening. He said, lyricist of the year? He said, this shit is crazy. And he walked up and he got the award, and that was so funny, but if you heard him, he's like, you know, he's thinking the lyricist like Karis won and so on, and he got the lyricist of the year. But the thing, the reason he got that was because Hip hop's supposed to be real, and his lyrics were real. So yes, I was at both of those things in '93 and '94, and uh, they were kind of amazing. And unfortunately, they didn't uh, last longer. But uh, you, uh, you, I don't know how many of you know about the Chrome Awards. If you want to hear some gossip, uh, 
there was a Chrome Awards and uh, I had gotten the, uh, the Photographer of the Year in Hip Hop Award. And then I sat back down. Uh, no, actually it was backwards. Uh, I, I got the award and I went up to accept the award and I got it up here and I went up to accept the award and I said, thank you. And at that time, Karis One had done a Nike commercial and in it, he said, the, the revolution will be about basketball. So I got up and everybody in hip hop was there because we didn't have a lot of award shows. So Latifah, Run DMZ, everybody was there. Heavy D, everybody. And I said, for those of you that supported me, thank you. I'm still in the game. I appreciate it. For those of you who put me down, I'm still here. And I said, just one little thing I want to share with the audience. The revolution, I'm a revolutionary. And the revolution will not be about no effing basketball. And everybody went crazy. So the next person they called on for the lyricist of the year was KRS-One. So he got up there and he said, since my brother Ernie decided to piss on my shoes, and when he called my name, I went up there and the FOI, the Nation of Islam, was the security. Let him let me go up. And he did this rhyme about uh, how corporations are stealing money from our, our communities and that uh, the way to get finance our communities is to get money from the corporations. And that's what he was doing. And then he comes and puts his hand in my face and he says, anyone who's so goddamn stupid that believes that I believe that the revolution is about uh, basketballs out of their mind. He put his finger, and then he said, and everybody was there, and they, they know we're getting ready to fight. And Kara says, let me show you how we deal with violence on the East Coast. And he grabbed my hand, he held it up, and he hugged me. And the whole crowd went crazy because they saw these brothers hugging one another. That was at the Chrome Awards. And that was like one of the most powerful moments in my life. And also, I didn't get my butt whipped, so. <laughs> KRS-1, knowledge reigns supreme over nearly everyone. That was amazing. Thank you. Thank you for <laughs> asking the question. No and for staying awake during my boring answers to these questions. Um, OK. So the, the last, well, okay, well, this is the last question. We'll see if we can squeeze her in. Um, someone just asked, what are Uncle Ernie's thoughts on these new generation rappers? I don't know if you want to answer that, but. <laughs> I saw a video called WAP. And uh, that, that WAP sound sounded like my boot hitting the TV. Uh, However, that being said, I also saw a video by Little Wayne called Don't Cry, which almost made me cry. And there's so much profound, profundity. It's such a profound video on so many levels. And I also had a Little Wayne in my studio when he was just a kid, twice. And uh, yes, a lot of what they do is horrible, but a lot of regular uh, mainstream hip hop was also horrible. We tend to forget about groups like Immature and you know so on and so forth. So uh, I saw recently uh, George Clinton on TV from Parliament Funkadelic. George is in his 80s, and they said, "George, you're the coolest cat on earth. How do you stay cool?" He says, "By being around young people and listening to them, and not putting them down and absorbing them." So yeah, there's some terrible stuff, but Akala is a young artist, A-K-A-L-A. -A. And there's a lot of young artists and a lot of them uh, don't want to be mumble rappers and a lot of them don't want to be clowns and a lot of them don't want to tattoo their faces and, you know, wear pink panties on their heads and, you know, all that craziness. So, but we've always had that. We've always had, you know, that duality. And my thing as an artist is you express yourself and don't follow you know, uh, don't follow trends, do you. And you'll be surprised when you find out who you are, how strong your voice can be. So yeah, hip hop is evolving, but I'm not gonna be that lame old guy and say it all sucks, no. There's a lot of stuff that sucked before and there's gonna be a lot of stuff that comes that sucks, but I'm not gonna put it all down because who knows when these young brothers and sisters 
uh, if I start putting them down and different people put them down, they're not going to be open to consciousness and they're never going to rise up above where they are. But if they're accepted, then they'll be listening and they'll be learning. And, you know, we need to love one another and, and be, uh, you know, incorporating man, and, and embrace, embrace them and let them find their voice. So I'm not going to put them down. I'm tempted to, but I'm not going to. A good answer <laughs> and you know what i actually really like that wap video so <laughs> don't judge gonna, me don't judge me talk. i'm not judging you i just couldn't you know we we're going to talk about it i'm not okay i'm, that's not, fine. Anti, I'm not anti-sexual or anti-sensual but there's a difference between eroticism and junk and there's ways and if you look at my erotic work, you'll understand the difference because eroticism should have some tinge of respect and love and not just, you know, booty. So. <laughs> I get that. I get that. Um, okay. Well, we're going to wrap up here. Um, once again, I just wanted to thank everybody for being here. I know we went a bit over time, but I think the conversation was just um, so beautiful and there's, there's, like, I, I think we could sit here for another couple hours and just honestly get into to so much more and, and really understand the evolution of hip hop. But yeah, I just, thank you, Shane. Thank you, Ernie. Thank you, Chaz. Um, and I hope everyone took something away from this conversation. Um, I, I really just did this because I wanted to open up some space for, you know, just to be connected with one another and to, I think there's often a lot of, um negativity around hip-hop and i wanted to open up that that love that um it's really coming from love and and consciousness and just understanding and telling a story um and i just want to give that space and you know how in the future when when covid is is not keeping us from one another i hope that we can have more workshops where we can come together um and really dive into each of the elements so Everybody, please stay tuned. And um, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you to the panelists. Really, really enjoyed this conversation, so. Thanks for the opportunity. It's so wonderful. And, and let me just end with saying this. I'll be 74 this month and I'm all of some of your grandfathers and to be given the respect and to be listened to and to be given that, that kindness means a lot to me because a lot of people of my age group you know, you, you tend to, we tend to fragment ourselves by race, by age, by gender, by he's gay, he's straight, he's the, you know, we need to get past that and start dealing with some inclusivity and learn. There's a lot I can learn from young people. There's a lot they can learn from me. There's a lot we can all learn from each other. We're all traveling on the same route. We're all fellow travelers. There's so much that we can learn and must learn from one another. How the hell did I live 74 years? They must, I must know something. You've been out there in the fire and you, you ain't burned? Damn. And you young kids, man, there's so much. There's so much that we can learn from each other. If we get past these isms and schisms and uh, he's gay, he's straight, he's white, he's been... Uh, nah, that's what the governments want. They want us to be isolated and, you know, uh, in, in little blocks. We need to do this, man. This is the most powerful weapon in the universe right here. That right there. That's that's us. Anybody know what the word faggot means? Anybody? It means a bundle of sticks, and the Romans did it. They showed bundles of sticks together, and the word was faggot. And the faggot word meant that with them sticks together, you could break one stick or two sticks. But with all them sticks together, you couldn't break them. And then we went and we used that word wrong and a slang. So there's a lot that we can do using this theory, okay? Thank you. Thank you, everybody.